I'll start with, I'll start with the IRS. Um, I used to get worried. We would get worried if, if uh, Patty Murray was on our tail or Ken Conrad, one senator, we would be upset. And it was always very important to try to run things. I said I, I always wanted to run things down the middle. Execute the law. I execute the law as written, not as I might wish it to be. And the idea is that that um, sometimes the Democrats are mad, and sometimes the Republicans are mad. You know right away when you do that job. You know after a month whether you can do the job of IRS commissioner, because your basic, the word you use most frequently is what? No. And oh, no. People, people pressure you, they want you to do things, and you have to be able to tell Chuck Grassley, no. And as long as you're telling Max Baucus, no, also, on a different set of issues, then everybody's happy. They actually expect you to say no, because they want an even-handed stewardship of that sensitive governmental agency. I always said that there are three agencies of government that Americans have every right to expect are totally nonpartisan. The FBI, the CIA, and the IRS. And in fact, since 9-11, it's become harder for the first two because their senior people have spent so much time in the West Wing. There was always, when I was at the service, a great separation from the West Wing and a great deal of independence. I'd worked, I'd worked on the White House staff in the Office of Management and Budget when I went after I'd helped create the Homeland Security Department as a deputy to Mitch, Mitch Daniels at OMB. And then I went over to, uh, to the IRS. And when I left, I'd had, you know, I'd had a nice large office. I had this uh, parking privilege on West Exec, if you know what that is. West Exec is a little road that's between the Eisenhower Building and the West Wing. And if you really think you're a big deal, you get a parking space. They have 70. It's, a, and it's, it's really something. You come out, the, and the West Wing is bathed in light. And it's not about Bush or, or Obama. It's really about the nation. And it's, it's, you really feel great when you walk out and you see that, see that, um, see the White House at night. Um, but when I went over to the IRS, I felt like I could go into Siberia. Uh, I they cut, they dropped me from the White House Christmas party list, and I mean all kinds of things happened. And uh, for a while, I thought that this was bad, but I realized that it actually was it freed me to do what I thought was right. With, with no, really nobody trying to reach in. Nobody trying to reach in. And um, I'll tell one story on this. Uh, I was in London, we just finished a conference with counterpart tax commissioners. And it was a Friday afternoon. So I called back to Washington, which meant it was a Friday morning here in the States. And um, Yolanda, one lady who worked in my office, answered the phone, I said, hello Yolanda, any messages? And she said, yes, uh, Carl Rose called. And I said, I don't know a Carl Rose. And she said, well, he knows you. I said, OK, what's the number? And she said, 456 something something. And that 456 is the prefix for the, uh, the White House uh, offices. And I said, could have been Carl Rove? And she said, could be, uh, you know, but um, she, she really didn't really know, well, probably really know who Carl Rove was. That's the God's honest truth. <laughs> um, so I call over, and sure enough, it was Carl. And um, he, he said, Mark, I don't want to get in trouble, and I don't want to get you in trouble. I just want to know what day of the week is the best day and what time of day for me to call in on your toll-free line and actually get through to somebody. So, <laughs> so you know, the point is there was, and that reflected a, a deference, and everybody, everybody in our administration knew that if you tried to reach in or call, that was wrong. So, so it really does pain me to see where the service is now with John Koskinen, 
who I think is a good man. John has a, comes with a, came to the service with a very distinguished record, as you probably all know. But to see him now under impeachment from the House, this is very troubling. The underlying conduct of what happened with the C4 mess, what was disclosed two years ago in May of 13, it's horrible. It should never have happened. The law provides most certainly that the IRS can take a look at these organizations from a point of view of their activities, but it can't take a look from a point of view of their policies. I usually have cold water and coffee at the same time. I don't know why. It's, uh, <laughs> just, it sort of happens. But, so the fact that they were screening the C4 applications on the basis of policy orientation was dead wrong. That was horrible. And then it was handled horribly uh, by the commissioner, Shulman, who did a lot of good things, when he didn't testify accurately and then he didn't correct his testimony before ways and means. I testified 50 times before Congress when I was at the service. And you're, you're totally dependent on your credibility. That's what happens. And, and he squandered that, so they were all ripped out of the frame when that happened. And then what happened when Koskinen came in, he had a honeymoon period, but these missing emails and the failure to disclose what had happened with the learner emails, and then he was rather defiant when he testified. Um, it got, it's gotten things to a horrible way. And if you think about it, I mean, Paul Ryan and Orrin Hatch are, they may have strong policy views, but they are each real gentlemen and very easy to deal with in terms of the interaction in Washington. And he managed to antagonize both of them, not to mention the, the government reform committee under ISA and then his successor. So now what happens is the, the service that already had very real issues, I testified in, in 12 about the intersection of the Affordable Care Act and the service's day job, saying that it was negative and it was in, inserting a controversial responsibility for a controversial statute in, in the portfolio of the service couldn't lead anywhere good for the tax system, and it hasn't. Uh, both from the point of view of the controversy, this is the bad old IRS doing Obamacare, and from the fact that so many of the very good people, those of you, you know, trying to communicate with the service, all their good systems people were put over to the ACA side. Just what had to happen. <clears throat> because they could not fail on that initiative. <clears throat> and I think they've done a credible job. So you had this convergence of these factors, identity theft that you're all familiar with, um, new responsibilities in the international arena, all of that happened at the same time that you then dumped on top of it the, uh, the, uh, the C4 controversy. And the C4 controversy is going to live with us for decades. It's analogous to Watergate. This is a mostly younger crowd, but I was in college during Watergate. Right after Watergate, there was a whole wave of congressmen that came in from the Dingles and the Waxmans and others, and their searing memory as they came on board was executive branch abuse of power by Richard Nixon. And that stayed with them for the three or four decades that they stayed in Congress. And you have now the election of a big cohort of people who just gotten there in the Tea Party in 10 and 14, and one of their very early formative experiences reinforces all of their worst thoughts about the service. And that won't go away right away. That will stick with us for a long time. So those of you who are inter intersecting or interacting with the service, uh, <clears throat> it's going to continue to be a, a, rough, a rough ride. Um, one of the ramifications of all this is that the funding has been cut, as you know, as punishment. The Republicans have said this is a punishment to get their attention. This is a very difficult passage for the service because they have to choose what they'll do and what they won't do. Those of you know, I mean, how many of you have been on, on the phone with the service and waited at least an hour? <laughs> yeah, look, look at that, the whole room, the whole room. <laughs> 
who is not waiting an hour? Uh, you gotta know the secret time to get through. I'll tell you, you know. But, uh, uh, the magic yeah, exactly. Um, I say to people, and I'm, the people I work with criticize me for saying this, but part of this is your own fault, by the way. CPAs are, you are too docile. You should be all over your congressional delegation complaining about this. The CPA is like the, the dog on the porch when the owner comes home and kicks the dog, the, the owner being the IRS, kicks the dog and then the dog licks the owner's ankle. And that's what you do because you're afraid somebody at the IRS is gonna come after you. Well, you better start complaining because this situation is not going to get any better. It's certainly not gonna get any better um, between now and the end of this presidential term because the Republicans are having too much fun and the president doesn't make it any better when the president, you know, the president says there's no corruption at the IRS in the middle of a, when the investigation was still going on or whatever else, people, it just gets the other side matter and now you see this impeachment. So, so that's the IRS. I would suggest to you, um, you know, buckle up, it's the problems, a lot of the good people are retiring. They haven't been able to bring on new people because of the, the, the paucity of funding. Um, this will take years to work its way out because what happens is eventually they will get new money, but when you hire somebody, it takes years to train them and frankly, you're taking the more experienced person to a certain degree offline to train that individual and that will have an impact. So writing this situation will, will take years. Um, if you look at the legislative situation, it's very interesting to me, the Republicans uh, an hour ago uh, elected Paul Ryan to be their nominee for speaker and he'll go through as speaker presumably tomorrow. This has, um, well, it remains to be seen what happened, what, how well he does, but I was, was thankful that he was going to be uh, chairman of Ways and Means because he had um, <coughs> such a commitment to areas like tax reform, like entitlement reform, healthcare reform that fall within the purview of, of, uh, of the committee. It's essential that that committee function with strong leadership as well as finance if you're going to get any prospects for tax reform. We'll see what happens. I, I know Kevin Brady, like Kevin well. I hope he gets through. There are other candidates as well. Um, but it was, was pointed out in, in a piece in Politico just today or yesterday, there are already something like six committee chairs from Texas in the House. So that makes it tough for somebody like Kevin. Um, we'll see what happens. I think that everything is pretty much on hold until you get through the elections. The question is, can some deals get struck around the highway funding? Where we were was, there was a consensus on both sides of the aisle, say, over a year ago, to do something about the corporate taxes, because there was a recognition on both sides that, that the, the higher rates were, to some degree, uh, limiting our competitive competitiveness in, in overseas. But if you think back to um, Camp's objection, which is totally correct, you can't just help the corporations and then get rid of certain tax, uh, tax expenditures and then, then, and then lower the corporate rates. As you know, most taxpayers are partnerships, flow through as individuals, and that's not gonna help them any if, you're, if it's gonna see their taxes go up. He got that whether you can strike a deal that just affects the corporation is pretty tough, especially if you think the president has not, uh, he's not attached a lot of, of um, priority to tax reform. But, uh, and you, you, he speaks about it, but he has never, never spent that much energy on it. You saw his true colors on this last year in the lame duck session when Reed and Camp struck a deal that then he sort of kiboshed. Because if you recall in the extenders, he said he was gonna help the businesses make certain things permanent. The houses wanted to make some of the extenders permanent. I think that's a good thing. The reason they wanna do this is that when you get to go to do tax reform, it's easier to make tax reform revenue neutral if you've already taken the hit 
the tax extenders, if you make them permanent, because they expire after a year or two, the out years, the out eight or nine years, the cost of those tax benefits doesn't get counted in the deficit projections. If you do it as a part of tax reform, then that's a drag on anything you're going to do in terms of rate reduction. So the Republicans would rather make certain things permanent now, and then when you do tax reform, they can make it revenue neutral. But you saw with the president, he said, nothing doing. He said, if you're going to make business expenditures permanent, you have to help the middle income, middle income people too. So it all fell apart. I think the most likely scenario most people would tend to believe is that, you know, sort of we get one more patch again as we get uh, closer to the end of the year. So people will wait for the election. Uh, when I look at the election, as, as Roger indicated, I'm a candidate. I, um, I do not like what we're doing as Republicans because the proposals that are being put forth, they may be thoughtful, but by and large, they don't replace the revenues that we have. They're not revenue neutral. If you're a Republican, I believe you've got to be chained to the concept of keeping those deficits down. They've come down, as you may know, they've come down to about 2.5% of GDP in this year that's just ended. That won't remain the case. I am 61 years old. As, as people my age start to draw benefits in extensive amounts, we will very quickly go right towards the cliff, and particularly if interest rates come up and financing the debt becomes more expensive. So to me, the idea that we're putting forth proposals that fall trillions of dollars short doesn't make sense at all. It's a recipe for Greece, and um, I don't like what I'm seeing there. I actually favor a proposal authored by a Bush 41 Treasury official who's now a, a professor at Columbia. It's called the Competitive Tax Plan. I, I, it's a framework that I support. I would make some adjustments. You, what it does is it puts in a consumption tax you, that would apply to everybody, uh, value added, goods and services, and everybody would pay that. But those, paying, those earning 50000 or less or 100000 for a couple, they would not pay income tax anymore. You'd return the income tax to what it was a century ago, say it only attaches to the higher earners. But at lower rates, this proposal would bring the rates down. And it would also bring down the corporate rates as well, so you'd be more, significantly more competitive overseas. I would adjust it to provide uh, more benefits on innovation. And cert I, I do believe, I don't take the traditional Republican position that some do, the, the very conservatives say, you can't have winners and losers. I think you have to have winners and losers. There's a difference. I, I lived in Indianapolis for a period of years. I still own a condo there. What I say, uh, and I ran, when I was under Mitch Daniels, I ran the workforce system there, the labor training programs, the unemployment system. And what was, the distinction I would draw is um, the tax posture definitely has an impact on manufacturing, as an example. There's no doubt about it. Indiana had the highest, has the highest per capita manufacturing in the country. Um, so companies could move, do their business elsewhere. Now, I needed a place to live when I was working for the governor. It, and I had a lovely condo that I bought, and we all helped subsidize that through the mortgage interest deduction. Well, I was going to live somewhere right near there whether I rent it or own. So it's hard for me to make the case that, from a public policy point of view, that that tax incentive is as important as, in this global economy, fostering innovation, the things that are so important here, through research and development, or manufacturing or agriculture, some of the things that really ultimately create, create value. So I would adjust this program that way. Um, but again, I don't see anything happening of significance with the possible exception of maybe, maybe there'll be some deal to bring back the money overseas through something that is done for the corporations because to get money to help on the highways and do some deal. But I, I'm rather skeptical about that just because it's sort of easier said than done. And there are still many who 
Um, I mean, it's interesting. We're not back in 04, if you recall, we had a holiday before. The idea was it was going to create jobs. All it did was you had stock buybacks and dividends. Didn't really create many jobs. Now, at least we're not having that same conversation. It's about, about maybe that money will be, you, that'll come in will be used to um, help the infrastructure. So, so we'll see if they can strike a deal. I'm fa rather skeptical on that. What I'm gonna do is stop there. That's sort of the, the tax world, if you will, in brief, at least as I see it. Now remember, you've had some fine technical presentations, but if you run the IRS, it's like you're running the hospital system. I'm not the guy, you don't ask that head of the hospital system some question about you know, pancreatic cancer. So I, I know some things, but not others in terms of the detail, but I've got the broad picture. So tailor your questions accordingly. And um, the other thing I'll say, I'll close with a brief advertisement for Alliant Group. What we do is large, we used to say at the IRS that the tax return of a General Electric or an Oracle or, or a Wells Fargo was nothing but an opening offer. And um, that's because they're constantly back and forth with the service. The service has people camped out at an Abbott Labs or a, you know, JP Morgan Chase or a Ford Motor Company. They're there the whole time. And there's a long list of items that are being reviewed and traded back and forth. The, um, the small and mid-sized businesses, including presumably many of the folks you work with, have a very different orientation, much more cautious. They're oftentimes overlooking benefits to which they're fully entitled. What we do at Alliant, and happy to talk to you about that too, if you want to grab me or something or shoot me an email, is we work in several very narrow but quite technically complex lanes of the tax code, like R&D, certain energy reduction credits, and um, areas, IC disk, and we have, a, we have a pretty robust tax controversy practice as well. And we help people make sure they're, it's not structured transactions, nothing like that. I work, remember we brought the KPMG matter when I was at the service, so I'm pretty against abusive shelters. I didn't want to go over to the dark side, but we, uh, <laughs> but we, we work on helping businesses make sure they're getting what they're entitled to, because many of the folks, like many of you, you are great generalists and know certain areas, but you, I, I always say, you're the internist and we're the cardiologists, we're the specialists. So. So we, we work in those areas, that's what we do. But um, take questions now for a few minutes. I don't want to get you off your agenda, but uh, on any, pretty much anything. Yes, go ahead. So yes, sir. Last year I heard the commissioner speak and he was saying that uh, right now there are 96 or something like that legacy systems running, some dating back, I think, to LBJ. Is, is the system beyond repair? Well, the problem, I've worked at the IRS, the INS, and I've run the labor department programs. The problem does start with the statutes. The statutes are so complicated. And the, 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 the problem with the systems is it's about the conversion because you've got to hold records open for 10 years under the law. And anytime you're trying to put a new system in, you've got to be doing the development work on the new system but maintain the old one to keep it, it current. Um, I'm not sure they have many systems that are that old anymore. That's sort of the logic. But the big, uh, uh, the big, the core stuff was moved over to a modernized platform when I was there. I think that there, it's been slow, though. The, you could argue the gutsiest decision I took when I was at the service was I mandated electronic filing for big corporations and not-for-profits. It, it, we'd had the authority to do that, but had not undertaken that. And I, I said, Somebody one day, we were talking about it, I said, well, why haven't we done it? And they said, well, there are no systems to enable us to do this, either at the IRS or in the businesses. And I said, well, why are there no systems? And the answer was, because there's no mandate. And I said, we can fix that, you know, and we did. Um, but they, they haven't, but they haven't, the, the example is, they put in all these new systems, but they're not using them correctly. Because the whole intent of putting in those systems was that you would be able to look across the tech firms and say, geez, you're out of line here, or you're out of line there. Look at, look at the pharmaceutical companies. And to say, Merck, you're out of line in these three areas compared to everything else. That's what you wanted to be able to do, is to rack and stack the data across industries. But to my knowledge, they, they, they know how all that data coming in, but they haven't taken it to the next step. And so part of the problem you get is the automation 
has been achieved, but the business processes have not been corrected and reviewed so that you're getting notices spat out and you call in and you say, we already paid this or something. They say, well, that's on a different system, but they're not tied together. And, and that's what they got to do. They got to stop and do that. And pardon me, that's easier said than done. They haven't, they haven't done it. So it's a continuing, it's a continuing problem. Yep, yep. Well, they're petrified about identity theft. Petrified. And uh, for good reason. I mean, you look at what is happening um, in terms of the cyber attacks that are taking place in businesses, well, independent of the government. This is a real issue. And, and I give them pretty good grades on this of everything else that's happened. But what it does is it, it really so much of that technology um, energy goes towards that set of issues. And then you had the Affordable Care Act that you can imagine what happens. I mean, uh, I had a guy wor who worked, um, he had a very important job. He ran the, he was responsible for all the financial institutions, banks, investment banks, accounting firms, hedge funds across the country, and also one fifth of the geographic area. And I said to him, he came, after he retired, he came to work part-time a day or two a week with us at Alliant. And uh, I said, Walter, did you have an impact? Did the ACA impact you? He said, oh, Mark, uh, he said, I had responsibility for all the insurance companies. And the first thing they did after pass was they took my two best actuaries off of my team and put them on the ACA team. Now, that means the two best actuaries in the whole IRS dealing with a big insurance company questions were no longer working on them. And so, that's what happened with, with, with that. So it's just an added problem. Other questions? Yes, sir. What is the IRS budget this year? And if you were commissioner, what would you say is a, a realistic number? Well, it's decreased by now. It's, it's, it's down at a level not seen for five or six years. I don't remember the precise numbers, but it's been whacked another three or four hundred million. Some of it's just a, some of it, frankly, is a punishment of Koskinen for the way things have have unfolded, and they've said that. They've said because the agency hasn't, hasn't cooperated. It needs more money, but it should be, get, I mean, you can overstate this case because the electronic filing continues to grow. Automation should improve things, but it gets back to the earlier question. If the business processes are all there, because what happens is things get handled multiple times, it's no better for the service than it is for you. Because think about that. You've got somebody who's taking your call, dealing with you, and then that's wasted because they're going to send you over to Roger instead of Mark couldn't handle it. It's got to go over to Roger. And that's not, that's not efficient either from their point of view. So yes, they need more money, but the, what they really need is you need, to, you need to reform the tax code and you need to do things that have an eye to administration. Like in the identity theft, as you all know, as employers, you don't have to get your wage information in until after you've already given it to the employee and the employee may have filed. That just creates an opportunity for identity theft that would be much more severely limited if the service already had the accurate end of year wage data when those returns started to be filed. But the Congress hasn't fixed that. So the service has limited maneuverability in certain areas. Other questions? Anything else? Uh, well, I have one for you, Mark. Yes, Roger. You know, it seems over the last several years, the IRS has become not only a tax collection organization, but an organization that administers social welfare. You mentioned the Affordable Care Act. We've got refundable tax credits. I think a lot of you folks have probably dealt with the earned income tax credit, stuff like that. And I don't know, it seems that it hasn't really done that particular job as well as it's done as tax collection job. Would you comment on that? Sure. The IRS, should, should they be in that business at all? Well. The earned income tax credit is always cited as the largest, what's called improper payment in, in the government. It's absolutely true. But what distinguishes the earned income tax credit from most other government programs that are sort of like it, there's no front end. It runs through the tax code. I, I testified about this before Tom Coburn years ago, and, and he said, you've got to fix this. And I said, Sir, Senator, it would take, if you gave me a billion dollars, it would take a billion dollars to make the amount of money even start to be comparable that food stamps or housing 
or any of the big other programs have in terms of administrative costs. Somebody comes in and they fill out information up front that it determines their eligibility for the benefit. You don't have that. People just fill out the forms, maybe they're helped, and then it's complex, there's multiple definitions, and then it's, it's all handled on the back end. So you're not spending that six or seven percent upfront load that you've got with programs that are farmed out from the federal government to the states and administered, and therefore you get a big error and fraud rate. It's not comparable, um, which gets back to your question, what do you run through the tax code? It, frankly, people like to run things through the tax code because then it's not considered welfare. Uh, but that, that, that conversation is changing, I would suggest. People are focused more on it now. Um, maybe because the earmarks, you know, the, the, a lot of that sort of changed. But I call tax, uh, the tax uh, provisions uh, nothing more than sort of, they're like earmarks on steroids, because they really are. They're very powerful and they escape a lot of notice. Anything else, any last question? I don't want to get you off, uh, but anyway, thank you very much and thanks, thanks to Roger for putting this program together and uh, um, it, we'll see you again, I hope. Thank you.